You've reached Monster 911, and I'm Lance Hightower. I've been taking cryptid emergency calls for over five years. If you have a cryptid emergency, please call our toll-free number, 866-306-8085. I can help you. What's your emergency? Now, something was happening when I first moved out here to the property and moved in with my wife. Okay. And I moved in with her. I won't mention her name, of course, but I sure. moved in with her. And every time I would walk out to the back of the property, we were talking about building a chicken coop, and I wanted to raise chickens because, um, you know, us bodybuilder workout guys were all pissed off about the egg supply issue. And I said, I'm going to control the eggs now from now on. That's right. No one's cutting off my egg supply and all this COVID lockdown BS and all this crap they're doing out here. Everybody out here, when he got out here to is that Houston was in lockdown and everyone was wearing masks. You come out here, everything looked normal, like a normal city. No one's wearing masks except probably a few people. Everything was like normal out here because they weren't putting up with that nonsense. And of course, no one was getting sick and dying. So yeah. I loved it out here. I was like, this is perfect. This is mostly a conservative, you know, you know, town out here. Mm -hmm. So I would walk out to the property and every time I got into a particular area of the property out back, which is exactly about 150 feet away from the patio, was roughly around 100 yards, and I'd go over there in this area. I kept getting cold chills and kept feeling like I'm being watched. I said to myself, so I thought that when this was happening, when I just moved in, that I weren't, I wasn't used to being in the woods. So I was, I was never ever around trees, sitting down, among, you know, out there in trees, going way out back and isolating myself where I literally can't see anything inside but trees. And I felt that I was feeling that type of uh, natural paranoia from not being used to being out in the woods. But at the same time, I loved being out there, but I felt uneasy, like I was being watched. Mm. Little did I know what was really going on. So one day, this is last year, uh, September, I was out here, and this was right in the fall, and I was coming back from out back, because I walk around the property all the time, because I'm always, you know, with coyotes are coming in here, grabbing my chickens, mm. taking them off out back, and eating them, and I keep finding their leftover carcasses all out there, and when the coyotes, say, every night I come in here, I would do inventory check, you know, go in the coop, see who's missing, check to see what's going on, and I brought right. hunters, you know, bought the hunter's blind and set up out here and see if I can lay with one of these critters out here by 22, and I haven't had any luck with that. But anyway, so the hawks are coming in, attacking the chickens. You have chicken hawks feeding on the chickens, all sorts of stuff. So everything is in balance. The strongest chickens right now have survived, and they're handling it pretty well. I haven't had any casualties in probably a couple of months. Anyway, other than what happened with the raccoon. So what happened was now, long story short, I'm out here, and I just happened to turn to the left and saw something that looked like a woman run across the property. And I turned my head, turned, it pulled my neck so fast. I rubber neck to the left so fast. I saw it for probably as quick as probably about one or two seconds. And I saw this thing that's gliding right past me and running, or her son lives right across, on two acres right across from us, my wife's son, with his okay. wife and kids. So it ran towards, so I turned around, I looked, and I said, what the heck was that? That's interesting. What am I seeing, ghost? So I turn around immediately. Now, you know, I always carry a firearm on the property out here. So I walked to see where it went, and I said, this thing went in the direction of the house. So I had no idea what the heck was going on. So I was concerned about it, so I decided not to say anything to my wife. And I said, let me just keep my mouth shut. So all I said to her, I said, I think we're having paranormal activity out here. She goes, What's going on? I said, I keep getting these weird vibes out here, like I'm being watched. And I said, it's probably just me not being used to the woods. She goes, so I said to her, you ever had anything like that happening here? I said, no. So one day, um, the guy that lives out here is a mother's dog. He works for an oil company also. And I was going to hear what actually happened now. So I'm talking to him, and I start his dog, um, her, his mom's dog kept coming over here and killing my chickens, killing my roosters, and I kept getting pissed off because she won't release the dog. And you're not allowed to have dogs running around the neighborhoods while you're just a leash law. And I don't want to create a problem with my neighbor. And I said, look, I need to talk to you for a second. Can you, can you guys leash the dog? He's killing my chickens because I kept fighting chickens right up here in the front yard, half eaten. And when coyotes grab the chickens, they run off That's right. and take it out back. 
Mm-hmm. So I set up the game cams and now I caught the dog on game cam uh, killing the chicks. I said, I have him on game cam. So I went ahead and showed it to him. He goes, man, I'm sorry, man. He goes, it's my mom. She just won't listen to me. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to build a fence. We have to we have to stop this from happening. I said, I don't want to have to go out there and shoot the dog. I, I can't be killing my neighbor's dog over eating chickens. I mean, I said, it's just crazy. I said, can he talk? Or so me and him started talking and I could tell right away that me and this guy were going to get along great that we clicked. Mm -hmm. He liked me. I like him. Everything was cool. So I said to him, man, I said, I keep getting a weird vibe over here. Every time I'm walking out there, this is, he looked at me, goes, Oh, what do you mean a weird vibe? He goes, you're getting like chills or something. He goes, so you don't know what happened out here on this property. So I looked at him and said, what do you mean happened on this property? He goes, before your wife bought the land out here, and built the house on this land. He said, the house across through that our son is living in, a woman committed suicide, came over here on your side of the property, over here, and found out, she found out that her husband was a pilot, and he was having an affair, and she found out about it, and she got the press, and she had two young kids, came over here on the property, and started to dig a shallow grave and I said, what do you mean digging a shallow grave? He goes, and she shot herself and fell into the shallow grave because in that area, there is a depression in the ground, a dugout area that looks like something, a dugout, an area. And when I stand in it or go near it, I keep feeling Lance, this weird feeling coming around me. Oh, man. And I said to him, you have got to be effing kidding me. I said, what? He goes, I got something to tell you. So I said to him, I saw the lady run by. I said, but something else happened. So he said, let me tell you something else. Also, my cousin came to visit me. And this guy's brother lives another couple acres right right beside him. He's got his neighbor, which is about a half an acre away. And his brother's another half an acre away. But all the rest of the homes are spit out. So he goes, my cousin came down from another state to visit me. And he went next door to talk to my brother to go hang out. And this was in the winter months. This happened a couple of years ago. And he said, no, actually about a year prior to I got here. And he said that he was walking down and saw a woman walking in the ditch. Right, they said, right where the, the, there was a ditch here, but the, but the, the whole property where our house is at, the 5,000 square foot house that we're living in right here, right. was all jungle, just all trees, all jungle. This, this five acres was all jungle. So animals were coming through here. And he said to me, that his um, cousin saw a lady walking down and freaked out because he noticed that he was looking right through her and realized that it was a ghost. So he ran in the house and he goes, man, there's a ghost outside. There's a ghost outside. And he was panicking in a state of panic. So he comes out there, the guy I'm talking to, right? I can't mention his name. Yep. I'll just call him Jay. Sure. And I said, so Jay comes out with his gun. He's like, what the heck? So nothing was there. His friend, his cousin, was in such a pissed state of panic. He jumped in his car and took off and left immediately. Oh, man. Okay, he won't even, he won't, Lance, the guy won't even come back here to visit. That's how scared he was. So when I heard this, I was not impressed. I said, what? He goes, I have something else to tell you. I said, what? This gets worse? I said, no. I said, okay, tell me what happened next. He goes, there's a lady and she jogs around. She's always walking around. I see her. She's an elderly lady. She's about probably around, no, probably probably about uh, mid 60s to 70s. She's in good shape. She she speeds walks all the time. He goes, you know that lady that walks around here? Well, he, she said that before. He goes, before I saw you show up here, because he knows my car, because I drive a Trans Am, and he, he, he knows, he's like, before your car showed up here, I figured that's when you moved in, which the woman here or whatever. He said, about a year ago, while your woman is living here in the property, she was walking by, the lady was walking by and saw that woman standing around the other side of the property, looking directly at the house. And she saw that it was a ghost, that the woman was invisible. She would look right through, you know, tra- you know, basically uh, transparent or whatever the heck it is. Yeah, transparent. She freaked, she freaked out and started running, tearing down the street to get the heck out of the area. Wow. And the funny thing about this, Lance, is I've talked to that lady many times before, and she's never brought this up. 
But little did I know that this thing what people talk about that when they run into cryptids out there, they get into these uh, situations where they encounter Sasquatch or Dog Man or a Raker and in these other Goat Man or what these other freaking well, things out it, there. Well, it just goes exist. to show you. It just goes to show you what? even with it with even with this the the spirit uh-huh. aspect of paranormal uh-huh. that people keep things very close to themselves, even if they uh-huh. see you every day and they live in the neighborhood. Until they yes. really get to know you or until you kind of break that ice and you physically go uh-huh. up face to face to them and you start uh-huh. over time. And this has happened several times where people will say, yeah, you know, I went and visited my neighbor, Mr. Johnson. I lived near him for seven years and we were talking one day uh, on, you know, one of many occasions. And I asked him if there was there was something odd, if he heard something strange last night and he looked at me. And then they, uh-huh. you know, he finally opens up that, well, yeah, uh-huh. don't you know about the story of X, Y, and Z, you know? So uh-huh. people always keep these, you know, incidents, these events close to them because natural human psychology and instinct says, I don't want people to view me as a nut or I don't want to be ridiculed uh-huh. as the neighbor that's nutty or, you know, here I am uh-huh. a professional and they won't. They won't view me as being professional if I see something because we, we've we all been taught through television and through uh, other media sources that you're crazy if you see a ghost. You're crazy if you hear a ghost. You're crazy if you say there's a Bigfoot. It's real. You hear a yell. Oh, you've watched too many of those shows. The thing of it is, uh-huh. is that a lot of this in my mind and this is my opinion, Uh but I think I'm right on track, is just been propaganda that's been put out by agencies. So Uh you can be viewed as that. So everybody just collectively (laughs) says, oh, yeah, you're a nut. And so, Uh uh, you know, the best way to to make something uh, not true or believable is you put out false information and propaganda. And they've done it very well over the years. Uh So... You know, ghosts, unfortunately, are real. Uh, uh-huh. They do have uh, a presence about them in which you know they're around because temperatures will typically drop in your area. I have felt that, I have felt that literally on this property in that area. Literally. And uh, now a lot of people will disagree with me. You know, I came upon an Indian burial ground by accident, my brothers and I. Holy and, crap. and it was Holy not, smokes. it was not a, it was not a known burial ground. It, it was, smokes. it's hidden. It's hidden. It still is. And I, I won't disclose where it's at, but, uh-huh. uh, we came upon it by accident because I took my EVP, my M, M, uh, EMP reader, electromagnetic, uh-huh. uh, uh, EMF reader, excuse me, electromagnetic right. frequency right. reader. And, uh-huh. um, typically it'll go off. If you put it up to a light or a socket or very, you have to be touching it and it'll hit uh-huh. red. It'll peg out and it makes a sound. Beep. Uh, uh-huh. It stays green. Otherwise, zero, zero dot zero, zero. And so we had this around camp because there had been some instances on some of the interviews that people swore up and down as these creatures were close. They might emit an electromagnetic frequency and your EMF reader oh. would go off. So I took it, I gave it to my brother, Bill, who put it in, who left it on and put it on his jacket and it kept going off red. It would just be pegging. Beep, 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 beep. And he goes, Lance, is this broke? Is it broken? And I said, it shouldn't be. I just bought it. So I picked it up from his hand and it was still doing this all night long. And then later, this was about one or two in the morning. I finally said, I've got an idea. And many of many of the people hearing this, I've said this numerous times, but I'll just go ahead and finish it up here on what it did. And I finally said, I got an idea. Give me a recorder. And I said, if there's someone with us right now, um, this won't hurt you. This is the only way I can hear you and know that you're present. Make this the this this uh, this e- equipment go off. To step close to it, and you can make it go off. Huh. And at that time, beep. I said, if Holy you're crap. if you're a male make this go off if you're female and then went beep and it, so i was getting an intelligent response to a question then when i listened back to my recorder which was later in uh-huh. the when, when when i went home the next day 
I was getting intelligent answers. I would, I, I would say, are you a female? And they would go beep. And then I heard, yes. And then I, I believe you. And then I asked an interesting question when I actually went back by myself. Holy and smokes. You're, you're brave. You're brave. I went back by myself and I told the landowner and the landowner agreed that he didn't tell me that there was, he said, there was a, there is a burial ground. I should have told you, but I didn't. So this confirms what you found. And I said, well, Holy I've learned smokes. to not touch. You don't touch anything. It's kind of very, very sacred ground. He goes, well, I can tell you one thing, Lance, they must like you because this is a holy ground to them. And I talked to a gentleman from uh, one of the local native tribes around here in Oklahoma. And he said, they must like you a lot. You must have showed respect. And I said, I did. And I said it. He goes, because usually if you enter one of these burial sites and you are not, you're not aware, they can really bring bad, some bad medicine on you and yeah. they, they can follow you. So I said, well, I gave respect when I recognized it and I went back by myself and a question that I asked, what was very interesting as I said, I wasn't aware that you were here. So my sincere apologies, I mean, no disrespect and I won't tell anyone and then I'll leave. I said, but I have a question. I am investigating these creatures, what we call cryptids. And what that is, is like a giant hairy giant uh, beast with hair. And then it went off beep. And I Holy said, smokes. and I said, it, it, are there any in this area? Beep. Went off. Holy smokes. And I said, are there one or many? And then you could hear on the recorder, many. And I said, do you view them in your eyes, a protector? Uh, how do you view them? is far if they're present in this area. And this is what I've listened to many times. And I think my brother Bill has listened to as well. And this is what I heard. I think demons. Holy smokes. And that's what I heard. And so well. <laughs> I didn't get to hear that until I went home and I can amplify the sound because I couldn't hear where I was at and I didn't have my computer. So that was a question that I've never heard anyone ask asked before it was it was such an odd rare moment but then i went back and um another rare interesting thing i don't think i've told people about is that i went back a third time by myself sure. and what i did is i brought a gift of my apologies for for i didn't want to desecrate this area and so i came back and I brought corn and I said, that I'll leave it right here. This is a token of my apology for coming here. We weren't, we weren't aware that you were here. We're here at uh, the landowner's permission, but we know that you were here prior to the landowner. This was your land. Mm -hmm. And then I got the beep. And then, um, I said, well, I just came to bring you this token of my apologies. I will leave. Before I leave, though, I'm going to say prayers and blessings that nothing attaches to me. I come in the name of the Lord. I come in peace. I come in respect. I mean no disrespect to you. So peace, prayer, and blessings be to you. May you rest in peace. And may nothing attach to me as I leave. Nothing to my vehicle or nothing to myself. And I wish to go in peace. And I will go in the Lord. And I will leave you alone. And yes. I, I, was le I had my recorder on. And I went home. Nothing, nothing strange occurred when I said that. I just left. It was about a five or ten minute visit, so to speak. And then uh, I got back home, and a couple days later, I played the recording. And while I was saying that prayer, I was standing at my vehicle. This is what I heard in the in the background as I was saying the prayer. <laughs> Holy smokes. And I stopped it. And it was ever so faint in the background, but you could clearly hear it. And I got my wife on. I said, listen to this. Listen to this. And she listened to that. She looked at me. She goes, you put that on there. And I said, 
<laughs> oh, I don't know how to put that on there. It's hard. To, yeah, it's hard to believe, but but it's hard, but I believe you because I, like said, I said I said I didn't put anything on there. This is the first time I've heard this. Here's the next interesting thing. I went back a fourth time, and a fifth time, and a sixth time. I've never been able to get an EVP since. It's quiet. Not one Man. signal. Not one signal. And I've been all over that bottom down there that's pretty creepy. I've been there at night and I've been at day. I've Man, been at the... night, Jesus, I tell you, Lance, you're brave. <laughs> and not yeah, one not one signal. Not nothing has come across. And so I went back and I explained this uh to a native friend of mine. I said, Is it possible? that someone can come in and release unrested spirits in an area like this, a burial ground with prayer and blessings. He said, yes, it is on one, on one instance it is. And I said, what's that instance? He goes, if they trust you and they believe you and you've shown respect, they will commit themselves to be released to the other side. Really? He, he, said, he said, you may have released them from the bondage they were in, this unrested area, because something tragic happened to them. And oh. that, and because the, this area where I'm at is actually, there was a lot of battles happen with the mm -hmm. Confederacy Army and the natives. They wanted off the land and they indiscriminately shot a lot of the natives, women, children. Uh -huh. And so there was bloody battles and skirmishes that happened that no one really tells of how bad it was. They didn't really document all that. But mm -hmm. I think what I came upon is a battle site and that this is where they lived. And so they buried them there. And that's why this area for years, the neighbor I was talking to who, who allowed me to go down in this area, he said he's heard drums down there for years at night years and i was literally literally drumming like like people playing drums yes and his neighbor would call him in the middle of the night and say can you stop the damn drumming i'm trying to sleep he said hey neighbor it's not me if you want to stop the drumming you walk down that road and go down in that river bottom area and you're welcome to go down there it's not me and it's <laughs> and it's not a pump jack you know a pump jack do, 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 do. and so I asked him, I called him and I said, have you heard any more drums? He goes, you know, Lance, I haven't. What happened? Mm -hmm. And I told him what I did. He says, oh my gosh. So I, I would like to think that I did good, so to speak, by going down there like I did. And the crazy thing is, the odd thing is I never felt any fear I never no felt negative, no negative energy. I never felt any negative energy. I never felt anything that I was going to be harmed. I felt nothing but uh, a sadness. I guess you could say it was a very solemn area. Um, I even going by myself at night, I never felt, um, afraid. Um, I felt more like I, I had to go down there. There was something that drew me down there that I had to, it was necessary and I, and I wasn't afraid and, and I wasn't uh, afraid that I was going to be a missing person or anything like that, obviously. And I always tell people where I'm going to go. Of course, my wife, she knows exactly. And I tell my neighbor who lives very close to there, I tell him as I'm coming by, Hey, I'm going to go down here. You know, if I don't call you back in an hour, you know, call my wife, something like that. Uh, but anyway, that was just a, I just wanted to sidetrack a little bit and tell you that story yes. because yeah, that, that is, <laughs> My, my story, my point with all that is that they are real. There's a lot of unrested spirits that died unexpectedly under real tragic emotional circumstances. And so what, what you're seeing, in other words, what is a spirit? A spirit is really a conscious energy of that person that no longer has a body. So you and I, we have a physical form, but really what makes me Lance and you, you, is not what you see, it's that spark of energy that God gave us, that consciousness, mm -hmm. right? That like That is real. The spirit. That spirit, that lives on. And so it's just, where is it going to live on at? 
you know? So the thing of it is, if when you have high emotional states in tragic circumstances, you know, those moments will replay in that area over and over and they don't know where to go. And so they've kind of lost souls, if you will, literally. So uh -huh. that's very interesting. I don't know. So this goes on in that area still right now. Where yes, you're... I, I, I believe this. And to, to, to give you an idea of what was about to happen. So after I talked to the guy and he mentioned to me, I, I mentioned to him what had happened, that I'd see this lady run by. What happened was he started to tell me something else. And I had no idea that I was going to actually have a face-to-face -face encounter with this female on the property because so this happened after I talked to him. So he mentioned to me that when he was about 12 or 13 years old, him and a buddy of his that lived inside this neighborhood, cause he's lived here in this neighborhood since he was a kid. Okay. That they were out there. There's another new neighborhood right next to this neighborhood. That's an HOA, which is actually, you know, meaning that, you know, homeowners association, all that. So him and the buddy was out back, and they used to go down there. There's a huge, uh, some type of massive pond out there in an area, which is literally probably about less than probably about two miles from where I'm sitting right here in the patio. And he said they were down there playing around and came across bones of children. I said, what? What? He said they freaked out, so they went ahead. He came home, told his parents, they called the cops. The sheriffs came out and checked it out. And here's the interesting thing. A developer had come in the area and he started to build homes in that very area, but not at that particular area yet. Okay. The homes, the roadways were being put in and the subdivision, which I can't name, of course, is everybody, anyone out here listening. To sure, know, sure. Immediately, they would know immediately that someone is living in this area, talking about an area. Okay. So they went ahead and did some research on the bodies and found out that there were probably almost a hundred bodies inside the area. I'm talking, I'm talking like where I'm sitting right here. Oh my gosh. This is within walking distance. So the sheriff came back and told him and said, we just found out after we carbon dated the bones, they thought it was a dump site of some, possibly killer kidnapper pedophile sure, that was sure. doing stuff with children dumping bodies back there and that's not what they found out so the guy told him and said look this is from the civil war that they were using the area as a dumping ground to dump the bodies of these soldiers and children that died during the war and dumped it off in that area because the area kind of goes down into kind of like a gully type of area and that's what that's what happened. Oh so they my. were carbon dating back to the 18th century, like the 1840s, 1850s. Some of it was 1890s. This is what he told them. So guess what the developer did once they found out what was going on? What? They went ahead and removed the bones and built the neighborhood right in the area. So I nearly crapped when I heard that. I'm like, you wow. got to be kidding me. Well, he here's the thing. Here's the thing. So this, yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, yeah, I'll let you continue there. My, I mean, my, what I was going to say here, I'm sorry, is uh -huh. just you can remove the bones, but that doesn't mean you move, remove the spirit. Uh huh. And so the spirit. sometimes removing the bones disturb it. <laughs> well, that that's true. So what, what's, what's, uh -huh. so they found over a hundred of these skeletons in this. It's, it's, yes. This, this is what he's saying. He said it was roughly around that many, a bunch of children were down there, a bunch of women, a bunch of men, because it was civil war. And what this area, particular wow. area is that during the civil war, the North had invaded the South and came down here. The South Southerners were having gun battles. A lot of gun battles took place. And when the Confederates were down here fighting those guys and they were getting killed down here. So this is what he mentioned. Now, he starts telling me now about something else that he had discovered in this neighborhood. This is concerning. Now, I'm more concerned about this than what I heard there. Okay. Because if crawlers live in caves... 
what is going on in this neighborhood? He went ahead on another property out back that someone was living on the property and was no longer living on the property. This house basically got abandoned. And he came across two car doors on the ground out there in the forest. Okay. So he and his buddy around, he was about, I think, like 14 or 15 at the time. So he said he, they were looking on the ground and they noticed that like tree limbs and pine needles were covering up this thing. And he said, wait a second here. What is, what is this door doing right here? So they went ahead and they tried to open it. It was like these old car doors from like 60s and 70s. Old to be, you know, the, the push button car doors where you hold a handle. Yeah. Push the button. You have to push the button for it to unlock the door and open the door. Yeah. It's not like it's not like you pull the actual lever, like pull the lever out. You have to press this button, this little rectangular silver button and open door. Right. When they opened, they tried to open it up and they couldn't get it open. It was locked with a key. So they came back and picked the lock and got it open. They said when they opened up, they noticed that it was the entrance of a cave around probably four feet wide by four feet tall. So he said that he went down in there, jumped inside there with a flashlight and shone the light, and just shined the light down there. And it was pitch black and it was obviously a tunnel. That thing is within a mile of where I'm sitting right here. So they got scared, came back out and locked it up and put the tree branches back over and covered up and never went back down there again and i looked at him i said you have got to be kidding me wow so what the heck is something like that i don't think anyone could have dug it open the... i don't believe that they could have dug tunnels like that because you'd have to have i don't think they could have dug tunnels like that with a lantern or what that was for but who discovered it well, someone it's someone obviously living on the property. Yeah, there's a lot of speculation and, we definitely can and, make on that. Right. I mean, it and put two right and put two car doors to lock together to lock and seal that hole with a key. <laughs> yeah. So I so 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 Lance, I have no proof that this has actually happened. I, I mean, I don't know if he's lying to me. It's on true, but the reason why I believe him. It's because what was going to happen next? Oh, sorry to interrupt. You were going to ask me something? No, no, no. Continue. So what happened now? So last, um, this was um, sometime around April. Spring was coming around, starting to warm up. Down, you know, when, when, when temperatures change in Texas, you got to adapt pretty fast. So one of my chickens disappeared. I went out back to walk to the back of the property because the, four, the three acres at the back we know the guy, he owns the 10 acres across, so he knows I go out there on the back, he doesn't care. Because okay. we live back here, so he's, he's a landscaper. So he know he's friends with my girlfriend's son, so he's cool. So, they, so I tell me that they didn't you know, I go around there all the time, no big deal. I maintain the property and, you know, check things out, keep, keep an eye on it. Right. So I'm back there, and I am back there walking around, and I found the signs that a couple of chickens were taken and eaten off. Obviously, a coyote attacks or bobcat attacks or something. Not sure what it is, but it's a coyote. I mean, I've seen this happen before. I've seen him on game cams walking with chickens in his mouth. I know it's him. I've been trying to catch him for a couple of years now. So I'm now coming back. And we have an old well house out there because we have to build a new well. My wife had to build a new well out there. So that well no longer works. That one dried up. So we had to cap that one off. And it's an old well house. So I'm coming back. And I'm coming back. And I see these two eyes looking at me, glowing at me. And as I'm coming up, I'm looking, and the first thing I thought it was, there's, there's a bunch of opossums running around out here at nighttime. So the first thing I thought was, it's the opossum hmm. that's inside the well house because some of the wood, the wood beams were cracked, and I saw these eyes looking back at me. So I paused for a second, and the eyes were shining really bright at me. And all in a sudden, what I saw next put me into a state of shock. I froze. I see the long blonde hair, I see the dress, and I realize it's a woman standing right there looking straight at me exactly 40 feet away. Oh my. And I went into utter shock. And I, I, I didn't, my heart rate didn't Good pick night. up. I was just in disbelief and I'm standing right there, eight o'clock in the evening with my headlamp on looking at this woman looking right at me and I'm looking through her 
Lance. Oh, you're looking. And I can see oh, through geez. her, and I can see the wood beam. And she looked at me, and she just walked right across and just disappeared, heading toward the son's property again. Oh, my god! So I was in such utter shock. I couldn't even move, and I said, okay. Wow. Now I know what's going on because here's what. Now I heard about her because the neighborhood told me about her. So when I looked at it, I walked in, I went inside. I said to my wife, you would not believe what just happened. She said, what is it? So she wasn't happy what she heard. She's like, she goes, oh, my God. I said, I just saw her out there. I was, you know how long I was looking at her? How long this went on? When it happened to me. I've heard people say this before about cryptid encounters that it seems like time stands still and right. things slow down. It's like you're caught in a time vortex or something like that. Right. And the shock, it, it is almost as if what I'm looking, what I'm looking at, as if the information was trying to process in my brain to make sense. I knew what I was looking at. And normally I thought my reaction was heart palpitations, blood pressure shooting up, panic attack faint you know pass out hit the ground i thought that would be my normal reaction right but instead it was a state of shock and the of me standing there i mean my normal reaction is would be draw your firearm if there's a threat but the urge to do that wasn't there i knew immediately it was her so what happened was now just two three weeks ago Oh, you remember, you remember when it was really hot and we didn't have any rain? Oh, yeah. No rain. And the rain finally came three weeks ago. And we finally got a good burst of rain for several days. And it was on a, a Sunday. So it was broad daylight. And we had some heavy rain. That just like a little small flash flood. The sun came right back out. So the yard was really wet. The chickens were out there loving it. So I stepped out here in the patio. And we just gotten through eating lunch. My wife and I and her mom. I step out here in the patio and I walk out here in my shorts and I look out there in the yard and I look at a distance. We had we chopped down some trees because we're getting ready to install some solar panels. We chopped down some trees to give the, uh, the roof um, some exposure. So we have a pile of uh, tree limbs and branches out there right in that area of that activity is where I had these uh, tree cutter guys uh, dump off the branches and dump it out back right there on the left about 150 feet from where I'm standing right here. So I walk out here and I just happen to look and I see two bright eyes looking at me in broad daylight with eye shine. Wow. So I'm looking at these eyes and I look around. The first thing I thought was, I thought it was the water that was reflecting off the actual leaves. Mm -hmm. That was my first reaction. I thought that's what I was seeing. So I came back inside and I said to my wife, I said, what the heck is that going? I said, there's an animal out there with eye shine and broad daylight. I don't know what it is. Then I started to look and all of a sudden I see the head turn and look away for a second, look right back and guess what it was? It was her again. Wow. So she I was went watching out there. You. Exactly. She was looking at me, direct eye contact a hundred feet away. So by the time my wife, I said, look, it took off. Did your wife see it? No, she didn't see it. It took off. It, she, the, the, the entity turned around. The lady oh, turned around wow. and walked off. So I went out there. Now, I wasn't too sure what I'd seen. So I grabbed my Ruger 1022, my little miniature semi-automatic rifle. And I went out there and I said, I don't know if it's a mountain lion up there or a panther or something up there. But I, I could. I, I kept saying to myself, you don't get eye shine in broad daylight. No. How is that possible? Well, the and yeah, it, I, I don't... Yeah, so, great question. I, the only way you would get a semi reflection like that is a uh, not so much a reflection where it would look that way. It would be more of an emittance of light, possibly. Yeah, possibly. So you, you, you know, you know. So so so, Lance. I mean, moving out here into the country or you know on the outskirts of major cities in areas like Montgomery County. You know, Woodlands, uh, David Crockett National Forest, you start to go Willis, Texas, start to go out there in these um, expanded areas of, uh, you know, in these uh, cities that are a little bit, you know, expanded, wider, you know, a little wider, opened up area mm -hmm. of more trees and jungle. When you come out here, I had no idea what my future had that I would be coming out here, living out here, experiencing these things that I would come across. Like, people in the city have no idea what the heck is going on. No, people as are. I begin. 
Right. Yeah. No, yeah. no. Yeah. People are, well, and it's one of those things where, you know, is it better? And I've said this many different ways and, 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 you know, for just a very simplistic way to say it is that, is it better to know what really exists or not know? Uh-huh. You know, and I think I, I agree. And and the reason why I say it that way, very uh, just very pragmatic is that is that I think it is always better to know. But in some respects, I will say it's better not to know with some people because uh-huh. it's too of an emotional uh, trauma uh-huh. for people to realize or uh-huh. come to realization that these creatures do exist, that. Uh, uh-huh. spiritual entities do exist and that uh-huh. it, it boggles their mind. It's too, you know, people fear what they don't understand, but you can also fear what you do understand as well. It goes both ways. And I think that in some respects, there is just groups of people and I don't blame them in many ways, uh-huh. but they just, just, you know, I don't want to know what's out there. I'll let someone else take care of that. I just want to go to my work. I want to get paid. I want to, you know, go watch my movies and be with my family and go to the soccer games and pay my bills yeah. and be left alone. I don't want to know that stuff because it's too frightening. You know, you, you, you know, lads, I have never actually contacted one of you guys that have these channels. You know, you guys that I call experts on the stuff that, 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 that want to talk about this stuff to people. And I was concern about coming on these uh you know shows and said man what if people recognize my voice and when i started really thinking about this and realizing this stuff was real i lost the fear and i said i've got to talk about this and let people know i have a, i haven't seen that lady since the incident happened three weeks ago and here's what i don't believe that she's a bad spirit i don't feel any threats from her any fear i still feel the weird chills out there and things like that but i don't believe that she's a bad spirit because i would if, i if, would if, agree I, i've never i've never felt bad energy from her i just feel energy but not bad energy so i believe that because she lived here and here's what the interesting thing is that that the girl, my wife's uh, son and his wife and kids live at the house that she lived at, and they haven't. They're, they're major churchgoers, and they have not complained about any incident. So we decided to keep our mouths shut and not say anything until we hear them say something, because they're the type of folks that don't believe in this. Yeah, don't and, believe in this type of stuff. Well, and if they're and if they're going to church, and you're doing the how I shall I say this? If you're doing the right things, right? And if you're, um, you know, committing your, you know, your life to Christ and I, mm-hmm. it, I'm a firm believer, nothing will touch you or harm you. And yes, and so, I mean, I'm a Christian. Yeah. I don't go to church, but I'm a Christian. Yeah. Too, and I believe, it, it, I believe in, I believe in God and stuff like that. And there is more. And I'm glad you brought on. that. I'm, I'm glad yeah. you brought that up <laughs> that because just because some, uh, a spirit is unrested, don't, doesn't make it bad. <laughs> doesn't make it that it's got some ill or malevolent intent that doesn't make it bad. There's just people that passed away from an unusual circumstance against high emotion, high event that they become, you know, we don't know all the circumstances, you know, we'll never know until, you know, we pass obviously, but I would say Uh that's a good point that you bring up. It was very much like, it sounds very much like what I experienced. I didn't feel anything, um, negative. I felt nothing. And I didn't, I didn't, I don't want to say I felt positive. I just didn't, I felt more sorrow than anything when I was down there, but I never felt negative. Like something was after me. Even when we didn't know that the spirits were down there, even when we didn't know, but what we did know is that that night was only supposed to get to like 48 degrees. Uh And the water jugs that I had froze solid that night where we were at in camp. What the heck? <laughs> and my wife, I asked her how cold it got at our house, which were as the crow flies from here, about five miles away. It got to 45 degrees at my house here and at camp, it that's, froze my water jugs. So what does that tell you? That, that is telling that, that that is, that is what you call evidence of activity for certain, because that's highly unusual. It was, it got so cold huh. that night. We burnt through all, all of that wood, 
I brought enough wood, different densities of wood, so it would last the night, just stoking it a little bit, because I knew it wasn't going to get but 48. It sounds cold, but it's really not when you've got gear on and jackets and sweaters. <laughs> and we burnt through that wood so fast that I had to cut wood while I was there. Uh, find no, that. So go ahead, I'm listening. I'm listening. to find yeah. dead wood, but it was so cold in camp that brother Bill was just shaking. He says, why is it so oh, freaking so cold? cold? And it was because we were surrounded uh -huh. by these. In know, if, yeah. If we think we understand how it works, probably the doorway or vortex had opened up and they had come out in from the other side of something else, well, which caused a temperature drop. Possibly at least here I'm thinking, we are. I understand yeah. Works. Uh -huh. We're in the center of this area, and here we have a fire going, and we have noises going on. We're making noises by talking, and we have a fire going on, so we, we something was a trigger. And uh -huh. I, go, I went back, and I recorded. Um, we were recording for a show, and I went through all of the, just a fraction, maybe 5% of the raw audio and, and the video, and I haven't even begun to go through it. And there is so many electronic voice phenomenon on this thing. It is crazy. Mm -hmm. I went back through and I was yes. listening to my, my uh, body cam video just last week. And I haven't listened to it before. Uh -huh. And I went through there and you could hear where I set the camera down. And I say, man, I'm going to uh -huh. get some coffee. It's cold. It's about two in the morning. And there was something on my recorder that says, I'm right here. Man. And so it, there's probably, who knows how much stuff is on there. I just haven't gone back, but be that oh, as it may, yeah. it's, it's over. I'm not getting any more EVPs. Everything is cool. I just, uh, again, I just bring that up just to mention that, and it's very interesting that you, you have this feeling, but you know, I think we mm -hmm. all have this ability to sense uh -huh. feelings and, you know, it gets mm -hmm. back this overall arching theme of what you and your buddy had have heard and witnessed uh -huh. and experienced is that. Uh, you know, to to kind of wrap things up here, I'll just say that when people feel something that's edgy and a lot of people will mm -hmm. say your spidey senses were going off, that gut sense, that sixth sense going off, or, or, or whether your spirit, angels. your guardian angel, guardian angel so you're the Holy happens. Spirit, listen to it. I, you don't I have to understand it. You <laughs> just have to act upon it. You know, what is that voice telling you to do right. now? I have a saying that goes like this. God communicates the man through our gut instinct. To follow your gut is to follow God. And if you think like, if, I mean, it's literally, that's probably what's going on. Your, your gut instinct, this is God guiding you to protect you. That's following right. Following your gut. And it, it could be, I have a story here that I need to tell you. This is going, this has never been told publicly before. Okay. I, I, I to, I've, I've told my wife this a couple of times and I said to her when I when I when I got on the uh, phone with you, I said I, before I did, I said I'm gonna tell I'm gonna tell the story here. Well, I, I'll tell you where I'm from. You know, so I have a slight accent. I'll tell you where I'm from. Of course, I won't disclose a country or location. Of course, we didn't blank that out. But I was born in Jamaica, and we left the country when I was uh, 13 and 14 years old because the country was going in a bad direction. You know, you know they were turning the country to communism all that a lot of people leaving all the foreigners you know all the all the, the people like us you know right. leaving and we had to get out thanks to ronald reagan of course because without him we wouldn't be alive today because he threatened the regime threatened the country said let the people go and we were able to get out of the country jump on an airplane abandon a car and fly right inside the country right at miami airport to be greeted by immigration and that man saved us a lot of us and I'm, I'm forever Fantastic. grateful, which explains why I'm, con why I'm conservative. Yes. So my, yes. So my father told me this story for the first time. I was 11 years old when I first heard it from him. He even told it to me a couple of times. He just passed me a couple of years ago. Oh, but he, he just told me the story and brought it back up throughout the years. And so he kept saying to me, until this day, the last time he told me this was probably about 15 years ago, he said, until this day, I cannot figure out what in the hell could have done something like that or what caused that to happen. So check this out. He's in his early 20s and down on that island, um, it's a Caribbean island. So he was in his 20s and he discovered that he was good at electronics, good at fixing appliances and he'd gotten his own job and 
his father had passed away. They're like nine brothers, a bunch of sisters, and everyone was pretty much just going off on their own, finding jobs, getting married, having their own families. And he was single. All his friends were already married, had kids, everything. He was the only one that wasn't married. He hadn't met my mother yet. And he decided to rent a room. They called it, they used the term down there, they called it boarding. I don't know why they use the term boarding. I mean, it's like you're boarding an airplane, but boarding down there, they, the words they used incorrectly, it meant, it meant leasing mm. a room. Okay. Basically, you're a tenant, a guy owns a house, he's got a big house, and he leases out rooms and rents out rooms to individuals, stuff like that. So he got his first uh, place and moved it. He even showed me the house where this thing happened. So the back of its turns was um, a forest down there because they have a lot of forest down there on that island. There's all sorts of weird stuff going on down there. So he's telling me the story, and we were, it was uh, the summer holidays. Um, I was um, 11 at the time, and he was a, my dad was a uh, television repairman, and him as a business partner fixed all the TVs down there. Everybody in New York say fix all the televisions, all the VCRs, all that stuff back then, and everybody would have to go to them. I mean, people be coming from halfway across the island just to get their TV. Up there. My dad was good at electronics, and he worked up here in Compact when he was up here for like 35 years before he retired. Really. So he um, was telling me that he leased a room, and he was watching television one night after uh, living there for about, it was probably about a month. He said four or five weeks. And he said that he's watching television one night, and he heard something like a rock hit the outside of the house. So the house was a brick house, basically, and it had some type of hardy plant type of wood frame at the back. Um, a lot of the homes down there, the construction, they were built by the English when the British was living on the island. Oh, okay. And they built a lot of subdivisions. Most people don't know that 90% of those homes down there on that island um, that are in the 50s and 60s were built by the British when the British were down there. But they kicked out the British out of the country. And everything just went downhill once that happened. So um, he was, so he heard the rock hit the house. He's like, what the heck was that? So he got up and didn't think anything of it. And then he heard another thump on the house. Thump! So this time he got up and walked outside and looked in the backyard. In the backyard, there was a light at the back of the top. And he looked out there, and there's this all jungle. I mean, there's like literally probably, he said probably 20, 30, 40, basically 40 miles of probably just nothing. No, no, probably no, 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 not 40. Probably, I think he was saying like 13 or 14 miles of all jungle, basically heading toward a mountain, to a hill, toward, mm. toward the hills and the mountains, basically. So the subdivision picture was down at the bottom. And the hills were basically going up 100 feet, 200 feet, 300 feet. So it's all this jungle, jungle, wood, you know, wood forest mm -hmm. back there of this small, small subdivision. So he went out there and saw these two small round rocks that looked like river rocks. And there was a couple of jagged rocks out there, you know, of, uh, you know, natural formation rock, almost looking like gravel rocks. But we didn't think anything of it. So he went back inside. Nothing happened, went to sleep, another couple of weeks passed, and one day he heard a large crash at the back of the house. Like something huge hit the house, wham! This time he felt the vibrations. It's like, what the hell is going on? So he gets up and goes outside and sees a big, jagged rock, about six inches big, jagged, that was on the ground, and looked and noticed that it had done some damage on the wood frame at the back of the house. Oh. Now, this is, this is a two-story house. Okay. So he's saying to himself, what the heck is going on? So he gets up, and he goes to go talk to, talk to the, uh, the, the, the owner of the house, the landlord that lived on the property, and said, something, someone is throwing rocks at the back of the house. And he said to him, I can't see how they're throwing rocks at the back of the house. So the landlord came out and looked at him and goes, that's kind of unusual. I heard a crash earlier. He goes, no, man, someone, someone came out here and threw the rock. He goes, man, if they keep doing it, I'm going to call the police. So he goes back to bed. Nothing happened. A couple of days later, all of a sudden now, a rock comes flying through the window, smashes out the glass over his head, goes wow. over the bed, over the bed, and smashes out the television screen. And the rock dropped right out of the television screen on the ground 15 feet in front of him. 
And this was at the second story. The second, he's on the second, yeah, the second story. Oh, wow. So the rock came through the window, smashed out the window, glass shattered, dropped on the bed in front of him, almost cut him up, smashed out the television screen. He was watching TV with some 14 inch uh, screen, black and white TV at the time, and it smashed out the TV screen. So he that got his attention. So he jumped up now, got the landlord. The landlord saw what happened, and this got crazy. He thought this was it. Guess what started happening next? Rocks started bombarding the house now. Rock after rock, smash, pow, pow, pow. So they go outside now, and they see these rocks coming up. At a distance, going airborne, hitting the house. The rocks are dropping right beside them. They have to now go inside. And they have to go inside the house. And they call the police. So the law enforcement came out. Right to the property in the middle of the night. And all of a sudden, by the time the law enforcement got the rocks stopped. So the rocks were piling up outside. Some of them were small, round rocks. Some of them were larger, jagged rocks. It was basically, dam- it was obviously damaging a sheet it was breaking bricks it was a shattering bricks at the lower part it was bricks probably about two feet of bricks followed by some type of a stucco or hardy plank type of thing they were using at the time right and it was damaging the house the window the windows were blown out all the tenants got up everybody's outside the cop cars come out there now the, the, the jamaican police come out there now so they came out there with a bullhorn a speaker and they saw what was going on and they went over to the speaker and said whoever you are Stop throwing the rocks. The cops said to them, we believe a group of people out there at a distance throwing rocks. So all of a sudden, the cops looked at this and stopped. And he he saw the cops talking to each other. And they're out there for a couple of minutes. And they're talking and talking. Mm -hmm. And what was being discussed, it came back up. Guess what they're saying? No one can throw a rock that size that far. Because it's over 100 feet from where the fork starts. So guess what started happening? They come back to the house, and all of a sudden, the rock throwing began again. Oh. This time, now, they see a bunch of rocks go airborne with their flashlights at a distance. So the rocks started coming down, almost hitting the cops, hitting the house, and started bombarding. So the cops drew their sidearms and the revolvers and rifles and started firing literally dozens of shots pow 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 firing all these shots and they went off my dad said his eardrums are about to burst he fired off over 50 rounds oh wow the cops started re- they started reloading their revolvers again so right when they reload their revolvers the rocks throwing stopped all of a sudden here comes another batch of rocks coming up again this time now they're opening fire they're taking cover and they freak out and said, we have to leave. We're calling the captain. Something is wrong. We don't know what the heck is going on. We have never seen anything like this. They got steered and left. So my dad had to pack up and abandon the property. And everyone packed up and abandoned the property immediately right in the middle of the night. Wow. That's so this, this is what in the heck is this is beyond me. I kept asking. I said, Dad. My dad goes, it just doesn't make any sense. Because no one could throw that many rocks at the same time. We're talking, he said the rocks were piling up to the point where it was literally hundreds and hundreds of rocks scattered out over the entire backyard, right next to the house, damaged the house. So they abandon the property. So about a couple of months later, my dad tried to reach the landlord and somehow got a hold of him and called and he picked up the phone and the landlord was at the house and said, this is really interesting. I left the house for a while and came back here to see if it was going to happen again. And the rock throwing stopped and all the rocks were gone. So he went ahead and leased out the house and it never ever happened again and no one complained about rocks and it never happened again. And he has no explanation for why that could have happened. Wow. Now, I don't know if anyone has ever heard anything like this. I've heard about Bigfoots and Sasquatch and throwing well, rocks. Well, there's rocks. This ro- is yeah. bizarre. Yeah, th- there has been instances where they have thrown rocks, many rocks. In fact, I just got through talking to a gentleman last night that was in a fishing boat, him and his grandson. 
and where they go out, not too far out of Tulsa, and it's a well-known area, I'll just say, and he said that every time they've gone in a boat, and it's a relatively small lake, but there's cliffs, there's rocks around one area. He said every time they've gone there, they were fishing, and there was a few pebbles, like, thrown. And they thought it was a fish coming out, like, bloop, you know, kind of uh -huh. splashing the top. But then as the night, the evening came out, they turned their lights on the boat to attract, you know, so they could see where they're going and they're night fishing. Then all of a sudden, <laughs> he said the, the rock, smokes. the rock sounded like it was the size of a softball, you know, or, or excuse me, yeah. uh, he said a soccer ball. <laughs> he said, the grandson said, well, I think they're on to us and we need to go grandpa. And well, so, so Man. this is a well-known area where they've had some instances or some um, events happen. And even the grandkids are keen and aware that these creatures exist. And he told the grandpa and the grandpa was smiling. He said, yeah, it's about time to go. And so they were in an area that was very secluded part of the lake. It was a cove and there was a lot of cliffs and everything which was a really good fishing area but they were having rocks thrown at them quite a few rocks i have another friend that lives down in southeast oklahoma mm -hmm. and he is a dentist and he basically was uh, in an area where um i won't say exactly where he has some property but uh it's where some um, bodies of water converge and he said, mm -hmm. you'll be down there at night. There was people that are down there canoeing or kayaking, and they'll have rocks being thrown at them. Boom, 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 boom. They never got hit, but they'll have rocks hitting the water like crazy. And the this gentleman I spoke oh. to yesterday, um, I won't, I haven't played the, the interview yet, so I won't give it all away. Mm -hmm. But basically, he was responsible for nighttime security years and years and years ago at a project in Oklahoma. And his responsibility was putting up these large, very large, bright lights that would shine at night on the heavy um, earth moving equipment so they wouldn't get vandalized uh -huh. like the bulldozers and Holy the, and the graders and the, and the diggers. So his job was just putting lights up and making sure that the whole perimeter, the whole area was lit it's up lit like up. daytime. And so he had to keep the generators all going and he had to pour the diesel fuel in there and make sure the lights, you know, change the lights out. And that's what he would do at night. And so when everybody would go home, he was there at night. Well, he said that many a time, and it was no big deal because he had a history of knowing. And here in Oklahoma, years ago, they called Bigfoot or Sasquatch. They gave it another name. They gave the name was Boogers. Boogers, right? They on. called them Boogers, and so he had known about them. And his dad, for years, being where they worked and everything, kind of in the logging industry, but mm -hmm. he said that these lights would always be knocked out. These Bigfoot, these boogers would take rocks, rocks and, and they would lies. and they would be a, like uh, they would have a couple in each hand and they would throw them. He said 200 yards, 150 yards and knock those lights out just like and you could That's, see them. I mean, <laughs> you could see man. them just hauling through the air. Sometimes you could see them coming out of the trees. Well, but, right, you could see the rocks coming out of the trees. That's what he said. Accurate. And then he would say he could also, there was many occasions where he saw them on the bank across the, the other side. He saw them on the bank and he would either be in a group of three and they would start yelling and going up and down and they would throw the rocks up and hit those lights and just with deadly point accuracy, knock them out. And he'd have to lower those lamps back and change out the lights and put them back up again. Uh, the first thought I thought about when my father mentioned the stories, because he told me four times, the first thing I thought about listening to Bigfoot, you know, type of shows like yours and others out there, I said to myself, right, I said, this, this sounded like probably around 10 or 20 Bigfoot, possibly, that just had a pile of rocks just going ballistic ape shit, basically, mm -hmm. and throwing rocks. And it's a very good explanation. And the distances... It seems like, Lance, based on your research and interviews and what you heard from these type of guys telling us about this rock throwing thing here, is a distance of 150 feet to 200 feet over 100 yards quite common 
with rock throwing? Well, I, I, I've heard it. The farthest I've heard was last night when I spoke to this gentleman who's 81 uh -huh. years old. And he said they were throwing distances of, he estimated about 150 yards up to 200. That is that requires a and, tremendous amount of torque oh, and strength. Oh, he that. said that because the, of, the uh, rocks were about the size of a. Uh, he said the rocks were anywhere the size of. I guess they would hit the lights and they would had that. They had this huge uh, aluminum uh, bowl around the bulb, you know, uh -huh. so they could direct right, the light. It. Yeah, they could direct the light down, and he said that they were so pinged and dinged up and bent from rocks and they would find all these rocks on the ground he said they averaged in size from um a golf ball to a baseball now think about this a Man, baseball size thrown at that distance yeah. he said that that's... the 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 earth moving equipment guys that would come in to run these heavy implement equipment they would come in and they would find rocks that were thrown so hard over the the mesh the wire mesh that was the wire mesh that covered the parts of the cage where the guy sits in it like for the 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 graders there's a part mesh mm -hmm. and the mesh is about as big as your pinky it's a very mm -hmm. thick heavy that is very thick it's uh -huh. it's extremely thick and it's in its and it's molded kind of woven through each other like a weave right that's right uh -huh. he said exactly. they would find dents up to a half inch or so in this where the rock would hit and would just burst and they would find rocks all around these implement equipment and he could hear them at night when they weren't hitting the lights he would hear the rocks bam they would hit some of the it would just like a crack it would hit the uh -huh. graders and this heavy earth moving equipment and in the next morning he would go out, he would see dings and marks and dents on this uh, uh -huh. this heavy equipment. And a lot of the guys that uh, were experiencing this as they were getting close to the evening to be relieved, they wanted to get out of there. And some of the these guys, equipment operators, they quit. They didn't want to do anything to do with that. That was a new project they were building in a very remote area. And um, it was the uh, Corps of Engineers that was doing this project. He said a lot of guys quit. A lot of guys Man. quit when this was happening because, and a lot of guys that stayed on the job, they basically come five o'clock in the winter time. Whenever right. daylight was going down, uh -huh. they were gone. They were gone. Right. They're like that. Say five o'clock is clear out. Uh huh. Yep, they're out. And if it, if it, Man. of course, in the winter time it gets darker earlier. They were out at four thirty. So yeah, it's. Yeah. So anyway, back to the rocks. Yeah, they can throw yeah. amazing distances. And even aside from rocks, these uh, mud patties. I talked to a gentleman that was a logger up in uh, one of the provinces up in Canada. And they were doing some remote logging with just a small group of guys. And they were frequently being hit on the side of their hard hats with mud patties that were made. By, and they were being thrown so accurate through the cage of those uh, graders. They would knock, the, hit the the helmet or the side of the face of these that guys. Is, that is pretty disturbing because the, 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 the ability to throw at a distance and hit a light bulb with that type of precision and accuracy. I mean, we're hunters, we use firearms, and we're having difficulty aiming at 200 yards for oh. knocking out targets with, with, with advanced equipment and projectiles, you know, as in bullets. And these guys are throwing rocks and hitting light bulbs. Well, think about this. 200 yards. Their, their this, strength. This, this is incredible. Their, their strength is supernatural. Their speed is supernatural. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. their arms are typically longer than much longer than ours. And in some cases, uh, so much longer, it's like throwing an atlatl. You know what an atlatl is? And I'm that, not sure what the heck that okay, is. Okay, an atlatl is a kind of a prehistoric form of... Uh, oh. I know what you're talking about, like a prehistoric thing that holds a rock. Yeah, well, no, it, that, that no, it it's a, and, yeah. no, it, it holds an arrow, but it gives you leverage. It's like leverage. Oh, it gives you extra torque. I think I know what you're so talking it, about. it's yeah. basically a piece of wood and a lot of the aboriginal, uh -huh. they'll use atlatls because, and even the Native Americans use atlatls um, in, in, throughout history and it, the, the the distance is incredible because you have this extra two 
to three foot of leverage where you can swing. So mm -hmm. basically, my point with that is that their arm length is so long and there's so much strength, it's like having an atlatl. They can throw it with dead mm -hmm. accuracy so fast that if you don't have a gun or a bow and you don't have that tool for hunting, but you have your bare hands and you have rocks, then that's what they've had to make do with. And they're highly, highly accurate and deadly accurate. Mm -hmm. It appears that they have evolved for so many millions of years, kind of like a lion or a tiger, to be able to hunt and take down large game efficiently, regularly, except that they're a humanoid, a bipedal, which means they chase things down on all four or probably both legs and can charge at high speeds with a lot of torque, a lot of strength, a lot of agility, take down deer and other animals or anything you're going after is not entirely impossible when you, when, when you, when you look at evolution, if we think we understand yeah, how, they're... How, envi how the environment can, can uh, help um, create conditions for animals to change and increase speed, agility, strength, things like that, possibly. Absolutely. And and that's, you know, if you're, if you are out in the wild and you do not have the ability to have a tool such as a bow, a gun, anything like that, which we know they don't, then you have to have another means of supporting life. So with their strength and their speed, their speed is beyond natural it's supernatural mm -hmm. so their reflex is so incredibly fast that it's a it, they, it has to be in order to capture a deer whether they're on four legs uh -huh. or two legs they're incredibly fast no oh and yeah, talking about that Lance. so so guess what happened here now um so when and i was at the property a week ago we were uh barbecuing some uh steak and we got the coal running, and he said, "Look, I said, let me handle some barbecue a lot." So I said, "Man, let me handle it, brother. I know how to get this thing here perfect." And we forgot the barbecue sauce, of course, but we had the barbecue. We had the right seasoning, so we got some uh, sweet peppers ready, got the got the beans ready, got all that stuff. You know, doing some real, you know, muscle building, country cooking right here outside. <laughs> the so it was probably about, um, I'd say, probably around. Uh, 9.45, and we began cooking. No, it was actually, no, I think it was like 8.45. So we got uh, got everything ready, and of course, I'm out there cooking. I'm watching to the left, right. I mean, I'm rubbernecking so much. I, you know, I I look, I don't, you know, look in one direction for no longer, probably 10 or 15 seconds before I take a look to the left, because that property line has got me concerned because of all those things we saw on the game cam and the weird feelings and all that. But that particular day, I never felt anything unusual out there other than a, probably a little strange vibe every once in a while. But the activity, whatever the heck was causing that type of thing down there, wasn't very active that day. But what was interesting was I, after we got through eating, I said, let's go check out the creek down there. Because uh, what had happened was uh, last year uh, in the fall, he was out there working in the yard and got a bad vibe come over but just happened to look right behind him and see two massive coyotes looking at him and he mentioned that they were black and brown in color mm. they were the size of germ of large german shepherds oh wow it's very interesting yeah the coyotes out here supposedly they're a cross between coyotes and the wolf that there's some type of hybrid a coyote that's black and brown now that may so be so some, yeah he said yeah he said they were the size of uh german shepherds large german shepherds and he didn't have a sidearm with him, so he did get a weird feeling come over him. So we were going, we think there's a bend down there in the creek that runs uh, through the property. Okay. So we were snooping around. I was heading down there to go take a look. So I said, Steve, I'll be right back. So I grabbed my Ruger 1022, my handgun, holster it, and I went ahead and put a 25 round mag inside the Ruger. You know, so, you know, your little 1022 turns into like a little miniature AR. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. I have a all sorts of high velocity rounds and they're all it's a mixture of um lead hunting rounds things like that high velocity things like that you know hollow point so i just happened to be walking to the right of the rv and i see these two orange eyes looking at me at a distance that look it didn't look like it was high off the ground it just looked at me for a second and i saw the head turn and that was it I said, I came back, I said, Steve, I just saw some orange eyes out here for a second. 
said, I wonder if there's a bobcat, but here is the problem I'm having with it, Lance. The eyes were large. Hmm. They were large orange eyes. I estimated distance to be probably about 100, I said probably about 150 yards. Over 200 feet, somewhere around that range. And that would make it probably, that would make the eyes being spotted literally on the dirt road. As passing through the neighborhood, which means that whatever it was, was on the dirt road. Okay. So we went out there, took a look. Didn't see anything out there. I checked right at the back of the property in that area, which is actually the front of the property. We entered the property to front. So that was actually to the left, heading toward uh, the, uh, the road. So we took a look at it. So by that time, we were getting pretty tired because it was a pretty hot day out there. And we'd um, sweated a lot out there in the heat. And we had to reacclimate to the heat because, you know, the temperature cooled down. And, and we hate the fact, you know, we hate the fall when fall comes around because the temperature cools down, the heat's back up, and we have to acclimate and adjust. But finally, fall kicks in around October, and we get the real cool temperature was dropping down to like 60s and 50s at night. So we saw that, so we went in, and um, we had our um, RV guy come out there and check the AC. We had the generator hooked up, so we just wanted to sleep in there at night to make sure everything was functioning optimally. Stove was working, we filled up the water, all that, and all that to make sure. So we were going to sleep there that night. And I said, I said, this door, I said, if there's a Bigfoot out there, he could just rip this door straight off and come right in on us. So I said, hopefully nothing like that happens. So I was really surprised when I heard him contact me by text. You know, I did copy the text and said, look, you can see him texting me like, Are you off today? This is Monday here. You wouldn't believe what just happened. And well, yeah, I need to yeah. talk to you. Right. So I was not expecting this. Yeah. So the crazy thing about this right here of us calling in to talk about our experiences out here, what, what could be going on out here with ghosts and all sorts of weird stuff here, is the fact that this is just the beginning of what we're about to experience is what this is looking like, meaning we're going to be calling you guys again. Hopefully we'll still be alive by then. If nothing happens, we'll wind up disappearing or anything like that. No, no we, won't, we won't We won't let that right. happen. We won't do it. Well, we won't let that happen. Well, because, since you, know, you we'll guys... Walk, yeah. Since you guys, you know, are there kind of permanently, obviously, uh, it might be something where I would love to plan to come down and do yes. some do some um, equipment investigation, setting up okay. audio and video equipment and kind of having uh -huh. a, a little bit of a command center. Yeah, if you want to do that, I'm going to talk about it because because um we we need we need friends like you guys that can come out here and can kind of uh walk us because because you you have you the, the kind of the kind of uh excursions you've been on and you know adventures or excursions adventures that you and your brother bill have been on i mean walking down to an area like that in a graveyard by yourself in the middle of the night that that right there I mean that takes that takes a level of of constructive thinking and reasoning at a brave level to really have confidence in yourself to get well, out there and understand the environment and the biofeedback of a, of a, of a, you know operating so to speak in that type of environment successfully and coming back out in one piece well to handle it psychologically is really impressive. Well, it, it it's just a matter of when you have confident in your abilities mm -hmm. and you have confident in the person or the people around you and their abilities. Mm -hmm. And, and I will say this, you know, I guess, thirdly, when you know that you are protected 100%, mm -hmm. and I know that sounds very bold and maybe very one-sided to say this, but I believe in the reason why I do these things and can do these things is I believe unequivocally 1000% that I am protected because I know that if I call upon the name of Jesus, I'm protected. Now it doesn't mean that I go without thinking. I have to use some smarts. I have to have faith in my ability and those people that come with me, but you know, and you have to use that uh, sense that God gave you, so to speak, mm -hmm. like we were talking about earlier. Right. But mm -hmm. that's kind of how I can do what I can do and why I do it. I truly want to know. I truly want to help people. And we need to, you know, get to the bottom of these things because it can affect people's lives, especially if they live there. 
you know, what is it specifically is going, what is causing this? How and, many, and here, are, how many are there? And we need uh -huh. to set kind of a precedent that, um, you know, you're going to have to, uh, to these creatures, you're going to have to, uh, live symbiotically in the area and, without causing yeah. a lot of problems to livestock and bothering people. And here's another thing too that's found out is that that particular road of where his property is at, that used to be an old town where there were buildings. An entire town was in that area with shops and they used to pass. I mean, there was a uh, some type of road and one of the um, older guys in here told me, said, if you walk around here with one of these um, metal detectors, you'll probably find a bunch of coins and all sorts of stuff. And so a road was literally going through his property. You know, back in the 18th century, 17th century, when people die, they just bury people inside their backyards or behind businesses and buildings. So there could be graves oh, in the area. Yeah, there's no telling what could be underneath the ground, but... It just seems like, I mean, the vibes, the energy I feel on his property is not good. Mm. Well, I mean, we, we, we went fishing um, last April, went fishing on a private lake that you have to pay to go on. And we came back with the boat or a John boat and we pulled up on the property and I had my back turned to that um, a fence right that all of a sudden I just got this bad vibe come over me. It was so bad as it's Steve something is wrong i'm feeling i'm i'm feeling it's nice so i pulled and i walked around your side and i drew my firearm out and i said something is over there either a, a large cat or something is over there I, I don't know what's going on you have something going on here and he goes man i feel this vibe all the time i said are you feeling it right it was not right now i said i'm feeling it so i went ahead and holstered back my my sidearm and i said man you need to be careful out here. I'm feeling something, and I was not expecting him to hear tree knocks over on the guy's property that close and things running off with heavy steps that appear to be bipedal. Yeah. This, this, got, this, got, my, this got my attention because... Well, what we need I mean, to do is definitely stay in contact with each other. Yes. And yes, then I mean, <laughs> um, what I was, what I'd like to do, you know, if, if I went down your way in, um, uh -huh. is... Uh, I would be more than one day there. I'd just stay there uh -huh. uh, a number of days to see what you can see. I'd look for prints, breakovers, mm -hmm. tree structures. Um, I would set recorders out in the timber, near the timber line uh -huh. of where he lives. Some of the things that I just wanted to reiterate that I texted mm -hmm. you earlier today. Yes, I remember reading is, that. Is, uh, and this is what I was trying to get to with um, your buddy there. Um, uh -huh. is that uh, a fence that's four foot in height is going to do nothing. Uh, so, I mean, I, I know that's kind of a, an aggressive move, but I would start with what you can do. You know, the solar mm -hmm. high lumen uh, motion activated lights are easy to install and they're very inexpensive. And uh -huh. I have them around my property. And so if something walks by, they go off immediately because light is a deterrent. It's a non-lethal uh -huh. deterrent. They go off and it alerts you too. You can uh -huh. also you can also set up the infinity beams. Now, infinity beams are always putting out an infrared or a, a beam that you really can't see. We can't see. They can. So they can stay clear of that. So that's not so much a added security for humans it is. But the lights are great. Um, these uh, motion activated lights. The, the other thing is, is that if, you know, down the road, I hope nothing keeps going on, but that, you know, high level fence, mm -hmm. high level fences, um, especially in Florida, they do this a lot. They, they'll put an eight to a 10 foot high perimeter fence around the, either the whole property or typically it's around the home. And, and out a ways, so where the kids play, so you don't have any predators coming in out of the woods uh -huh. and immediately right. go. So you have to make it difficult for predators or other animals uh -huh. to come into your livestock. And they'll put up 
um, you know, a, 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 either an oval or a square perimeter of a high fence area. So that was the other thing that I texted you. But the solar is good. You can still put up the game cameras. If you want to deter them away, mm -hmm. I'd put the game cameras up where they can just easily see them. But I would probably raise them about five to six feet. The mm -hmm. other thing that I would do is I would look at the property where he parks his fifth wheel and I would just do a start from that point and work outward in a circle and I would raise all the canopies up on the trees. I would raise them up with a saw or a chainsaw or a pole saw and I would raise them up anywhere from the 10 to 12 foot mark. So they can't hide behind any thick foliage. I would clear all the heavy dense brush from the ground so it's clear uh -huh. all the way away. It's clear. Nothing can hide yeah. behind something. You could see it. We, so you could shine a light and they can't. Yeah, he's pretty, yeah. Yeah. He's pretty clear back there. He's got trees behind the uh, <clears throat> RV, but he, it's already, it's uh, the area is pretty much cleared out. He's cleared out a lot Good. of uh, trees back there. You can see, you can, you can walk all the way around the RV. When he's standing facing the RV, you can actually see all the way around. If there's anything behind there, you can, you can, there is enough, <clears throat> there is enough room. If he's got cameras on there, active cameras on there, let's just say that he's in the RV and he had cameras outside the RV. He can literally see everything around him for certain. Okay, good. But I have to agree with you right here about the cameras. I believe the cameras need to go up way up inside those trees, and lights need to be connected to those trees, those high lumen lights with motion detectors that if anything comes on the property, lights in the turret, because we have to find some way to keep it off there. Because if his wife and the kids <clears throat> are going out there, that, that perimeter fence being eight or nine feet tall can act as a slide. We know Sasquatch can just knock down the fence and come through, but they, if the kids get out and they're out there running around when he's not there and they see something, it gives them <clears> enough time to basically run inside and said, okay, let's get inside. That's and it. Here's the interesting thing now is that the coyotes are on the property and he never sees them anymore. As soon as he brings the kids down there and the girl, the, the six-year-old goes out there, starts walking around, just right 40, 50 feet from him, the coyotes come out. So he's being watched all the time, and that kind of surprised them. Yeah. I said, isn't that interesting? You're out there, you're not seeing them. As soon as your young daughter goes out there, these animals see smaller games, supposedly, and they're sizing her up as a potential meal. And the, well, and, and they can too. In the, you know, with kids, yeah. coyotes can attack yeah. small animal and even humans. They do. It's, it's rare, but in uh -huh. packs, they get very bold and the hungry they exactly. are, they can, they can definitely do it. The, the thing that concerns me is the kids and I would, that's the perimeter fence. Now, you know, I don't know what that would cost, but even though the Sasquatch could easily rip that down, the whole point of it is there has been some instances where I have done interviews, especially one out of Florida that I remember, of a young man that was at a camp. He lived at a camp, him and his folks. And the, the chain leap fence saved his life. It was a barrier. This Bigfoot ran him. This kid literally was in tip-top shape for his age. He was like 17, 16. He scaled that in a he scaled it in a bound. He 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 jumped up, put a foot on the fence, threw his other leg over a bobbed wire. It had bobbed wire on it. Threw it over, tore oh, part of his sucks. jacket, and landed on the other side and stopped. And the Bigfoot came up to the fence, looking at him, growling. Right. So in other words, some of these animals. They may not, they'll see a fence and they're capable of taking the fence down because it's not a strong fence, but the fence acts as a turn. He, he hasn't, the Bigfoot or Sasquatch has not really tested the fence because it was a, a fence, literally a barrier is what it sounds like. He went ahead and stopped thinking that it could actually stop him. So right. it's a possibility that it did it, right. It's so just it a barrier. You, yeah, it's, right. a, it's a it's barrier. A bar it's it a barrier to stop. Time. Mm -hmm. So you'll have time to run off before he figures out that he could just tear the fence down and come through. Yeah, and I, I wouldn't let those kids so out of I my agree. sight. I wouldn't let the kids out of my sight. I'd make them wear brightly colored shirts. Mm -hmm. And um, I would definitely instruct them without putting too much fear in them. They are not to wander off. Mm -hmm. They are to stay very close. And uh, I, I wouldn't let them out of my sight. I, I wouldn't even go in for 30 seconds. There's too many missing kids 
in these yeah. national forest areas that happened in a matter uh -huh. of seconds. So I, I would mean, yeah. I would start with some of those, um, and then um, you know there's a whole host of other things that we can talk about that can be done. It just depends on what your buddy really wants to do, you and you guys want to do, and I hope it doesn't get any. I know it's early on in the stages here, yeah. but, so I understand what you said earlier, but we'll definitely keep in contact with each other. And it, yeah. if it still continues like this, I, I would really like to make it a point to go down there and, and stay. Yeah, uh, because, um, yeah, yeah, Lance, I'll, I'll talk about it because um, something I, I just mentioned something uh, uh, today uh, before we talked earlier, and I said, you know, this thing here going on down there at the property, I said, this is just the beginning of your problem right here for what you heard. And this could escalate. And I said, <laughs> I said, I don't know what to tell you. I'm not sure how we're going to handle it. I said, let me call Lance Hightower and listen to him. He specializes in this stuff right here to get an opinion because, you know, we're, we're like smart guys, but we're smart, but we're smart enough to listen and, and, and hear other ideas and how to handle it. And I think sure. that lighting up the property and, putting up lights and basically creating a conditions to keep these uh, boogers off the property because whatever the heck it is, you know, it's not the type of guy to make up stories like this. He's a real practical smart oh, guy. Oh yeah. Yeah. And you and both he, sound he, like he, that he, too. He, right, exactly. I mean, he wouldn't make up something like this and just say, look, you know, this happened just to scare the crap out of him. You know, just, he's not in, this is not who he is. Right. Right. And he's, he's really concerned. And the fact that something may have moved the RV or shifted the RV while he was in there. Well, if, if it was enough wife, to wake him up. Real, okay, this is really, really freaking serious. Well, this and the way, really I, serious. the way I look at this is that if there was something that got so close up to his domicile, with and knowing, in my opinion, knowing that he was in there along with his um, yeah. wife, that, that's concerning. And... Uh, mm -hmm. It, when you have a creature like that coming that close to do that, you have to think, uh -huh. why would they do that? They're doing why? it. Uh -huh. They're doing it to basically tell you you're not to be here. Uh, this is you need to stay away from the property. Uh, I'm I'm here. Um, I don't want you around. And so mm -hmm. if if it moved enough for him to wake up, then then something not a man. I mean, a man hopefully has enough reason to not do that. And that would be something that a human would do. You you just wouldn't, and, you wouldn't do that. That doesn't make any sense. And I've got something even more insane to tell you right here. The guy that lives on that property, the old man has a son and the son is some type of crackhead method. And that guy had recently got out of jail and spotted the guy's son on his game cam a couple of weeks ago. That trespass on his property came over and stole two gas tanks, gas cans off the property. And the game cam took a picture of him because he didn't see the game cams out there at 4 a.m. inside the morning. So the guy's son is walking around the property through that guy's property. Yeah. I'll where bet. that Bigfoot probably was and walked out in the middle of the night and went over across the fence and went on the property. Well, he's, he's, he's ig got yeah, ignorance is bliss. He doesn't, he doesn't know. He right. doesn't know. That's the thing is that what I would guy, say. He's, when I when I look at this, I said, that guy is a complete idiot. He's mm -hmm. walking around looking for things to steal 4 a.m. in the night in an area where Sasquatches are probably passing through and doesn't have any idea stealing gas tanks. <laughs> so they finally arrested him. Um, someone, someone he stole from someone else. Someone caught him. They locked him. Oh, out okay, good, good. But, but that, but that right there, I, I said, can you imagine this guy's walking around in the middle of the night, doesn't believe in this stuff right here, and the guy gets attacked on the property, taken away and disappears? Can you imagine that? Well, and and that gets back so, to it's better to know. It's better to be uh -huh, cautious yeah. and know, rather than just be totally uh, uh, oblivious to something that happens immediately that you didn't plan for. There's no contingencies. You didn't plan to take yeah. anything. You had, you don't have a firearm. You don't have a light. You're, 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 you know, you're one of David Politis. He's going to be writing about you. Uh -huh. Um, exactly. so, so, well, what I'll do here is, uh, we'll, um, we'll, um, get off here and uh -huh. each kind of go to bed uh -huh. here. 
and then uh, yes, keep me posted. Nice. You've got my number. Yes. Keep me posted. Yeah. And if if uh, your buddy wants to contact me again, feel free. You can. Uh, yeah. e you've got my email, and you've got this this number. And I'll be uh -huh. thinking about you guys and praying for you guys, yeah. and I'll be thinking some more. And if I come up with yeah. anything, another thought, I'll go ahead and send your way. Yeah, Lance, and I just want to say that, you know, I really enjoy your show here. I listen to your stuff like Thank you. all the time right here. My wife listens to your stuff, too, and we listen to different Bigfoot stuff. We like, we like the Dixie Cryptid guy, too, but but the man to talk to was you because I like your interviewing style. You actually listen to us and take the time to really get more involved. And we I just Thank have you. a feeling that we're going to have some crazy things happen. Where we're going to be contacting you again soon and say, you wouldn't believe what just happened. <laughs> so... I really, I really, I really appreciate you all talking to us and, and spending the time to hear me out and hear what I had to say here, and what my experiences were because these things are really, you know, they really did happen. Yes, stuff yes. The ghosts, all that. These things are really, really happening, and it's real. It's real, and, and it happens to real people. And and people that backpack that have never been in the national forest that put on a backpack and just walk out into the middle of a camping trail out there, no firearm and all this stuff here and they're doing these things these people i hate to say but these people they are really 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 ignorant because if you if you listen first and hear of a possibility of what could be going on what type of creatures could be out there what type of animals may be out there what type of possibilities are out there your mind will be a little bit more prepared but simply backpacking and heading out there by yourself on these camping trails or going hunting and not really paying attention it it, it, it could be a very devastating experience well, it can. a lot and of bad things can happen and know? a lot of these people what they should do if they intend to walk these trails uh they should uh, read yeah. some of the missing person 411 books and so they can get educated uh -huh. a little bit what not to be involved yeah. you know where he's mm -hmm. where you know Mr. Politis is not writing about them yeah. um so yes. um i appreciate anyway, your yeah, yeah, I appreciate your time and your wife uh -huh. and uh, your buddy there. Uh, thank uh -huh. him for me. And uh, okay. if anything comes up, let me know. In the meantime, yeah. if I think of anything, I'll get in contact with you. But thank you so much for the kind yes. words. Okay, thanks. And, thanks, Lance. And uh, thank you so much. Have a uh -huh. wonderful evening. Bless to you guys. Okay, you uh, too. And prayers. And uh, we'll talk soon. We'll keep in uh -huh. contact. Okay, sounds good, Lance. Okay, have a great night. We'll keep in touch. You too. Take right, care. Thank you, man. Okay, all right, good night. Okay, good night. Bye, bye, bye. bye. Okay, wow. Um, this is quite the interview, guys. I know it was kind of lengthy, but, uh, you know, it's uh, just a lot of strangeness with these gentlemen. And, and as you heard, you know, they're down to earth, um, they're professionals, and they're in properties. As a lot of people this past, you know, 2020 with COVID and all that hit, and now we've got this inflationary times and you know food if you've been to the grocery store like i have you know food's gone up and everybody's kind of getting upset and freaking out and so people my point with that is that everybody's buying property right they're buying a few acres here or much more than a few acres and usually it's just kind of virgin land and or there might be a small home on it or they're putting their a trailer on there or a double wide or they're building a cabin or a home or whatnot there that's kind of where they want to settle a lot of people are working from home remotely or they're willing to commute daily you know uh, just to get out of the cities and um, that's kind of the case with these two gentlemen and their families and uh, damn what they're talking about is really quite a uh, an, an in this interesting area the um, not only the lay of the land, the topography, but just the foliage and the um, the plant life. Um, it, it's it's dense. It, it's 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 a forest, obviously, having a national forest close by, but uh, it, it's super dense with swamp areas, sandy areas, and so it's a it's an interesting area by far. Um, but these areas that people go into, where you buy a property. Um, especially near wildlife refuges, wildlife management areas, and let alone national parks. These areas could and do have these, um, these creatures available uh, readily on them at times. And now when I say creatures, uh, let me just say I encompass beings too with that. 
Sasquatch, Dogman, and there's other types of creatures we just don't have a name for. Like he talked about one that's like a, a neighbor that had something on a game camera that looked thin and white and pale and it was like a rake, which, you know, you can do a little bit of research on what that looks like if you just get on and do a little bit of uh, investigation. It, it's quite terrifying, the sights of these. And this is not the first time I've heard this. I've heard this on numerous other occasions, not only from other shows, but people that I've interviewed that have seen in town climbing on trees or in the road. As I mentioned to him about this uh, gentleman that was secondhand, he was relaying what his girlfriend saw in the middle of a road that was massive, that looked like a, uh, a massive rake right in the middle of the road. Uh, so my point is that, you know, these areas harbor things that we just have never really experienced. That, you know... These areas are very remote and, and never really been populated. It's been left untapped for years and decades with not a lot of people, traffic, moving. Um, so you need to be cautious when you move to a new area. I know it's, you know, you got good feelings, it's your land, you've got all these, it's just a good time, you know, uh, buying the property on your own and, and, living outside of a city. It's a, it's a good feeling. Um, for those of you that, you know, that's their goal. And as it was my wife and I, and that's where, you know, we live right now. We live out in the country, fairly remote. Um, now we have obviously technology and, uh, you know, internet, which really helps of course, in television and all those things, uh, to make things a little bit more, uh, comfortable. Um, but just be careful, be mindful about when you learn about the woods. Learn about your area. Talk to your neighbors. Get to know your neighbors. Very, very important here. Get to know your neighbors. In the city, you hardly know them. I would highly recommend it as a requirement to get to know some neighbors in your area. Even if they're a mile away, if that's the closest neighbor, get to know them. And if they've been there for some time, you'd be surprised what you can learn. And if you start having issues or interesting things happen, you can always find a moment, a good time to say, bring up something. And you can say it in such a way that, um, you know, you can kind of point the finger, you know, uh, I know this sounds a bit crazy, uh, and, and maybe I am, but I heard something kind of crazy last night. Did you hear it too? You know, that's kind of how I approach things. Um, or, has there been anything weird happened in this area? You know, I'm just curious, you know. So I bring things up like that to my neighbor and she'll inform me. So I know my neighbors really well. And that's what, that's what I would do. Get to know your neighbors really well. Get to know the area. But as you heard from these guests, he didn't know a lot what happened with the lady that, um, uh, you know, uh, committed suicide and a whole host of things. So not only does his friend and him, you know, his friend especially possibly have a Sasquatch on hand. My concern is that they're shaking the trailer. But my concern is that there's kids there um, coyotes, as Wiley Day would say, they're, they're becoming more bold. They're not afraid of people. I've never seen more of a black coyote, but there is circumstances in which if you, if they're breeding with other wolves or they're more of a, uh, there's different, um, coyotes further South that are black and in color. So that was the other exception that just brought to mind when he said that they could be interbreeding. So, um, when you do that too, you, I think, change the dynamics of their thinking and they're a little bit more aggressive. They got to be watching those kids, especially with the snow perimeter fence. That's concerned me. I, I put a perimeter fence up, definitely do the lights, the motion activated lights, solar. You just can't beat them. I've had mine up for two years. They work flawless. They work great. Um, there's some other things I'm going to recommend. I'm definitely going to stay in contact with these guys. So, you know, when it comes to the spirits, uh, we didn't talk about that. I would basically bless my house. Uh, which I'll talk to him about later. I'll bless the house that he's in. I bless his property, which I've done mine. Um, it's not that hard to do. And so I'll probably follow up with him about that. Um, but basically, you just want to use, you know, have some good common sense when you go out. These creatures are prevalent. They are among many places, especially down in um, Texas. But... Um, you know, you can be smart about everything by learning with these shows. So if you guys have, uh, uh, I appreciate you hanging around here. It's been a long uh, interview. And uh, if you've had any 
concerns or any encounters, uh, whether it be a UFO, uh, these creatures, cryptids, as well as on the spiritual aspect, um, give me a call on the toll-free number anytime and uh, leave a message, and I'll contact you as soon as possible. I wish you the best out there, guys. I hope everybody's doing safe, everybody's healthy and well. In the meantime, until next time, this is Lance with Monster 911. Take care. <laughs>